the reason I moved to LA is because I, w I was living in Chicago um, and I wasn't making any money. And I was in a play with, as an actor, I was an actor first. And I was in a play with a guy who was like, Jeremy, it's so crazy. Like, I just went to LA and I immediately got cast in a pilot. Like, it's so easy. And I was like, <laughs> and like, because I'd had sort of like an easy time of it getting cast in shows in Chicago and I was sort of hitting my ceiling in Chicago, I could already feel like, because Chicago's a great city to become, a, to start out as a working anything, but specifically in the theater, it's like a great place to start out because they like, there will be jobs, jobs upon jobs upon jobs, but you will start to see that like, the same person that's going out to play like an 18 year old black boy has been going out to play 18 year old black boys for the last like decade. <laughs> and, and like, and I was like, oh, I don't know that I want that to be my career. Um, so I moved to LA and I was like, I'm gonna be famous. And um, I like auditioned for a bunch of, I had, I had a pretty good agent really quickly. I auditioned for a bunch of pilots and then I didn't get anything. Um, and I was really depressed and I worked at Barney's at the time. And one day randomly, I just was like, I woke up and I was like, I actually like working at Barney's more than I like going to auditions for things that I don't think are well written and that like I don't feel good in. And I'd written a play in college and I always, and all, all my, all, everyone was like, you should be a writer, you should be a writer, you should be a writer. And I really rejected that. But when I was in LA, I realized that like everyone was an actor in this way that like where, where I was from back home, being an actor was like this like cosmopolitan thing. And like, but like being in LA and being like you're an actor means that you're like a roach or something. Like something like you don't stand back. So I was like, oh, like I, I'm a playwright. And everyone was like, what? And I was like, I'm a playwright. And I was sort of like, the playing it. And, like, and, and in LA, people don't want to read screenplays, so they definitely don't want to read a play. But they're very excited that you write plays and not screenplays. So it like, kind of like made, me, made, me, made me like the weird friend of a lot of people. So I just like was there, and I, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world, but I went there because I was like really depressed, and I think that LA is a great place to go and reinvent yourself. Um, I think that historically that's what it is. And I think that like there, I got to wear a mask that like slowly fit by the end of my six years. But why? But why theater? Why not? Why, I mean, if you're going yeah. to be writing, and also if you're going to be inventing yourself, why not invent yourself in a way that communicates in this mass medium? Like why? Yeah. Like theater is very artisanal, um, yeah. and it's a it's a very unique experience. What was it about the stage that you were like, oh yeah, those are my people? I was, so I was always really, I don't know what it was. I, I was, I'm, a, I'm a cinephile, like I'm a deep cinephile. And I've watched like so many movies, but I, I've never, I've never got, I, 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 growing up I had obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, watching movies was like one of the ways I would like work through obsessions, but they, it never eased my obsessions, it actually like added to them. Um, whereas like when I would be on stage, when I got, got cast my first, I got cast in um, My Fair Lady. And um, when I got, when I was Higgins, I was really good. <laughs> um, and when I got cast in My Fair Lady, I, like all of my tics, all of my rituals, like disappeared for the entire four hour rehearsal period. And I didn't have to think about, I didn't think about anything. I didn't worry that if I didn't answer my phone, that my mom was dead. I didn't worry that like, if I didn't scratch the table the right way, that like, you know, it was all this weird stuff that like freaked me out and caused like me to have like deep panic attacks, didn't exist anymore. And so I think the theater was like this, it was like an actual drug. It was like a drug that like, not like a drug that was like, I'm high. It's like a drug that was like, I'm, I'm calm. It was like a sedate, it's a sedating drug. And I think that like, there was something that really excited me about being able to be in a room full of people that like was different from movies, right? You know, like. Um, I actually go, go to see a lot of movies by myself. Um, but that's not to say that I didn't try to be a screenwriter, too. <laughs> it was just that, like, you know, if, like, if actors in LA, if film actors are, like, roaches and, like, screenwriters are, like, rats, like, every, like, you know, like, <laughs> you're, like, the, the barista gives you a script. So I also didn't want to be that person either. Um, but, like, Lena Dunham was someone I really, really loved. Like, I thought Girls was, like, the coolest thing ever. Um, but also, I thought it was, like, deeply easy. I was like, I was like, oh, like, that's writing? Like, that's screenwriting? <laughs> I can do that. Like, if, like, if, like, all I have to do is, like, write about myself and my friends, like, hanging out, like, I can do it. And I actually think that, like, I say this all the time, Lena Dunham is responsible for, like, so many people writing now. Like, so many people felt like they could do it because she made it really accessible in a way that like we wanted it to be accessible. I think the same with like Woody Allen like inspired all these like different filmmakers and like that like group of like dudes in the 70s who were like we're all friends and like I made like you know fucking like what's that movie about the bank and the 
a dog's day afternoon and like he made like Godfather and we were all just hanging out at the table smoking cigars like and all these like young men were like we're gonna go to film school and like do this thing um I think Lena Dunham did that for a lot of people who don't feel who didn't feel like they were Martin Scorsese or George Lucas right mm -hmm. like she was my George Lucas and my Woody Allen I was like oh I get it and, I, and again problematic for some people and a lot of people but like also like, she did really good work. Um, so anyway, so I met, actually met a producer on Girls and became like a really good friend of him. And I was like, I, I wanna write on Girls. And he was like, okay, <laughs> like, um, that's a strong statement to have. Like, what makes you call it? I was like, I can do it, I've written plays. And, I, and, and he was like, okay, cool, like, give me a sample of something you've written for the screen. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so literally, I went home and on Microsoft Word, where most plays are written, I wrote an entire, um, an entire spec script of Girls called Someone's Calling, which I still think would have been the best episode of Girls ever, <laughs> um, had anyone read it. Um, but like, I went to this dude and I was like, hey man, like, I have this thing, here it is, it's called, th and he was like, whoa, 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 like that's literally illegal. Like you have to give me a spec for something else, cause like, if I have, if any idea in this is like an idea that's on Girls, then like, you can sue me. And I was like, oh, crazy. He's like, also, this looks like it's written on Word. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, like, that's how you write. And he's like, no. And he bought me Final Draft, what? told me to learn how to use it, and then to like, write something. So I wrote my an original pilot called The Live-In that was about my best friend who was like a live-in nanny at the time in LA. She also was like a live-in nanny who had like a casual like cocaine addiction, but that's just like kind of like <laughs> what LA is. Which is like, like, literally, that's like why she got dropped from a record label, that's why her parents had cut her off and why she had to be a living nanny. Like her dad was like a millionaire and she was like a living nanny for like millionaires in LA, like doing the jobs that like a woman had done for her for a long time. Um, and I was so interested in that. And so I, I wrote myself into the show, but I was like, I'm not like Lena, like I'm not gonna be the lead. Like I actually wanna have like a female driven like comedy, but I'm gonna be like the like comic relief friend. Um, I was like, cause that, that's new, no one's done that. Um, <laughs> And, um, and people were really impressed by it. They like, thought it was really exciting. And then I got hired as an assistant to like, a lot of people who thought I was such an exciting writer that I should assist them in rewriting their scripts. Yeah. Um, and that was when I was just like, this is stupid. Like, I was like, this is stupid. Everything everyone writes is bad. Like, I, like, and th I was working for people who, oh God. Oh. God. <laughs> Some of them were really talented. <laughs> the ones who are talented know that I think they're talented. Um, so if you tweet any of this, just like l put that part in, like the ones who know they're talented know. But um, the ones who don't, I don't talk to anymore. And, but I was surprised that like the ones that weren't talented got as much work as they did. Yeah. It was like shocking. I was like, how is this possible? Especially because I was also like in this like weird crew of like my old friends in New York and Chicago who were just like, um, there's like the, like any, any person in here who might write plays or has written plays, know that there is a Dropbox or a Google Drive that has a script you've written that you thought no one else had seen. But uh, a, a lot of 19 and 23 year olds are reading them voraciously um, and passing them around and stealing them from desk and it's amazing. Um, I actually hate it because a bunch of like kids are like, oh my God, I have the first draft of Slave Play. I'm like, how the fuck did you get that? But I also know I was that kid, right? Like Amy Herzog hates that I have this one script that she's like, how the fuck did you get that? I'm like, I don't know, man, like it's on this drive. Um, anyway, I was reading all these scripts and I was just like, I miss theater, theater's so cool. The theater's idiosyncratic. Theater doesn't have like rules. Like I, I, I can't even, like when you go into a most screenwriters, lofts or their like room where they their office they have like like um like notes of every single moment's gonna happen and then switches and all this other stuff and i had never met a playwright that had ever done that like ever it felt like playwriting felt so like here out and like when i would talk to people about a play or, or about an idea it would be here out and they'd be really excited by it but then they'd be like well what happens next and i'm like i don't know the characters haven't told me and they're like that sounds like playwriting so um, I realized that like I wanted to be a playwright. Like I just like had to do that. And so one of the people I worked for was really amazing. Um, and he said, um, you should do that. And I remember that uh, I had auditioned for a play in Chicago by um, someone who just told me I should say hi to you, Christopher Shin. Oh, yeah, he told me yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So <laughs> he and I had, had like a, a long-standing email relationship because I was in the final two to be in this play right when I moved to LA. But like it was like Chicago hire only, and they were like, "We really want you, but you live in LA and we can't afford to house you, and like you don't have housing here." And I was like, "Okay." He's like, "But just keep emailing me all the time." So I emailed him and the director all the time. They promised me that we'd work together one day. And Chris told me 
uh, I emailed Chris. I was like, I want to be a playwright. What do I have to do? He was like, stop writing in Final Draft. And I was like, I'm now addicted to it. I can't not do that. And he was like, well, just figure out how to write better in Final Draft um, and make it look more like a play. And I was like, okay. Um, and so then he was like, you should just apply to things. And so he gave me a list of all the things his students applied to. And one of those things was this thing called the OOB Festival. And at the time, I had been like hanging out with a, uh, a musician and traveling the world with them. And they were also trying to tell me, like, you need to just go out there, do the thing, do the thing, do the thing. And I was like, OK, like, can you? And, oh, and one of them was like, oh, did you, like, if you literally do this thing, I will help you in any way you need. I was like, well, I'm thinking about writing a play about a musician. Like, will you write music for it? And she was like, absolutely. So she like scored these songs I wrote for this play. I wrote the play in like three days because they're like, um, the thing, the like uh, deadline for OB was like seven days after I had found out about it. So I wrote it in like three days. She scored the, she made this re these really shitty beats that were <laughs> like shitty for her, but like amazing for theater, right? Um, like, 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 as we know, when you listen to a musical, you never want to hear that on the radio generally. So it's like, um, and so she wrote this play that had music in it, and like the Samuel French people called me and they were like, "This is insane. We've never read anything like this. Like, uh, like where are you from, <laughs> basically?" And I was like, "Did I get in?" They're like, "We're not sure, but like, we just want to know more about you." So I like, told them more about me. And then I got in. I was like one of the 30 people, and like over 1,300 people had applied to this thing. And that was like my first bit of affirmation. And then I got into this thing, and I like failed immediately. Um, I didn't win because my play was to uh, one of the there were six judges, and like five of them wanted the play, and one of them said this is the most offensive play that they had ever seen in their entire life, and they didn't want uh, to like throw their support behind it. They're like, they're like, I will quit the jury if this person wins. So like, yeah, and um, and it was really funny because I was at a residency with them a year ago and they didn't remember that. And I was like, yeah, you really made me have a mental breakdown. Um, but, um, so they, so anyway, I lost that thing. I cried outside in the in the like rush of tears. I realized all I ever wanted to do was be in a room with people listening to me squirming uncomfortably, jumping up and down, and giving me a standing ovation. Like that's like all I want. Because you like, he was like, that's what happened at the end. Like I got a standing ovation, and that was my big thing. Like the righteous thing, I like yelled outside to my friend as I was crying. I was like, I'm the only person that got a standing ovation today. Like, how did I lose? And she was like, Sometimes you just do. Sometimes you just do. Um, so then I applied to McDowell Colony. I met Amy Herzog. Amy Herzog told me to apply to Yale, and then I became a playwright. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that experience you describe of writing a play that that um, very self-inflicted uh, it sounds, looks like a painful thing that, mm -hmm. that that writing is I think you have described uh, your plays as the product of reckoning with different parts of yourself and that you apply this radical honesty and I think you've described it as bleeding on the page mm -hmm. uh, which sounds hard <laughs> and painful. Um, but I do wonder, what is it like when you're writing? And does it make you feel more vulnerable when your stuff is being received? Um, there's like a lot of good questions inside of that one. Um, I think that like when I'm writing, it's complicated because I think that like being an actor helps writing feel really easy for me. Because I always feel like I'm sort of like acting, like I'll be like, my roommate will see me in the living room at like 3 a.m. Because I write from like 11 to 5, basically. Like I have this, my friend, like there's in that New York Magazine thing, like like this writer followed me around and it's like really psychotic. Because like, um, it's like a step into the life of Jeremy O'Harris. And um, my friend was like, Jeremy, like you shouldn't have done that interview. Like everyone's going to think you're actually crazy because like I know that you can write after being up all day and like I know that that's the only way you write is like being up all day and like writing at midnight and playing a lot of music because like, I think that like general people just like you, you sound psychotic and I was like I was like I know but like I, what am I supposed to, am I supposed to lie but anyway I, I'll be up at like midnight 1am in the living room like anime's blasting and like I'll have like you know uh you know s s like the soundtrack to good time playing and um I'll be writing a monologue and like whispering it to myself as it's coming out and then just like crying profusely and my roommate will come out and tell me to sh like turn the music down because he's a Virgo and um <laughs> and I'll be like and I'll, I'll turn around and be like what and he's like oh you're in that moment you're doing that thing and I was like oh I'm sorry I'm so sorry and he's like yeah I'll just 
can you please just be a little more quiet? But like, I get it. But like, it's not. But it, but also like, he everyone. I, it gives. It, I get away with it a lot. I probably shouldn't say this publicly. Everyone thinks that when I'm crying, it's like hurting me or something. And it's like actually not. Like being honest isn't hard for me. It's like actually, um, what's hard is getting. Uh, comfortable being on, or getting into the right space for honesty, right? So that's why I have to like trick my body to be honest by like staying up to like the, the till I'm drained. All of my like um, all my devices are gone, and I just have to like look at myself in front of a computer screen and be like, no, but what do you really think? You know? Um, so that part's easy actually. It's just like once you figured once I figured out how to like um, recreate something more often and like more regularly, it was like being like, oh yeah, like. Um, it works really good when I'm like not sleeping a lot. <laughs> um, it's like uh, it works really good when um, I have had a long time with the ideas, because then like the ideas are all there, but then the like the reality of the the ideas can intersect with them if I've sat with the ideas long enough for them not to be like uh, vapid, for them to be full. Um, and then uh, it it just comes out, it pours out really quickly. And I think the thing that's hard about the way it's received is that. I think that um, I think that people, because every playwright's different, right? And I think that people read a bunch of books about well, how plays are written, and like certain things get said more often than other things. And people pick up on one thing more than other. And I think that sometimes people think that like the work I do is like more calculated than it is. Like I'm like like out here being like, and then <laughs> he's gonna say Starbucks. It's like <laughs> no, it's like it's like literally. I was just like like you know when I was when it, like I literally came up with the entire idea of slave play at a party in within 25 minutes. Because it was just like it was so true to the conversation and like my own like full history and the, an idea I've been thinking about forever that it came out so easily that it wasn't difficult to just put it down on paper, right? And I think that uh, when people talk about the calculations that they feel or like I like you know the, the the characters being ideas and not people and I'm like well what the fuck I mean like of course they're not people they're fucking people on a play like you know what I mean? so it's like you know it's like it's like they're not like you're a person you know what I mean but like. A per I'm not. I'm basically not a person right now. I'm like an avatar of Jeremy O'Hara's, right? Like again, like I'm performing a certain thing. Like you know, the most the the most person you are is when you're observing. I think because you like don't have to do anything. But the minute you're doing something is the minute you like stop being a person in general, right? Um, and so like you become like an idea of yourself or an idea that people need. And like and like so the ideas in the play are the ideas that I think the passive people in the audience need. Some people don't need them. Some people don't want them, and that's great. But some people do. Um, and so I get weird about the way critics, um, d d uh, d like, meaning make not the play, but, like, my psyche in through their writing. Like, that's, that's where I get vulnerable or uncomfortable because I'm, like, I'm being really honest with you. Um, and so can you, like, not try to, like, um, psychoanalyze me? Can you just, like, criticize the play? Um, which is the thing I saw um, in, some, in, in a lot of the reviews of Daddy that made me really pissed off. Because again, I have, I have, like, because I was a critic, I don't give a fuck what anyone has to say about my play because I know what my dramaturgy is and what it, how it's doing. What I do have a problem with is people talking about me and not like the work I'm doing. Because I'm ready to have like an intellectual sparring match about like how melodrama works. Because like, I'm sorry, Ben Brandt. Like, I know for a fact you haven't read as much 19th century melodrama as me. Like, I literally know that. Like, and like, and, and if he has, that's great. But I know what his job was before he was a theater critic. Now, if Hilton Now said something about it, I would be like, oh, you probably did do the research on this because like you're Hilton Owls and you're a fucking like embodied critic, you know? Um, <laughs> but like, it's like a diff it's like a difference, right? Um, and so, and and like, you know, having critics say that like the. Like I mean, even oh god I can't I'm not I'm not, not going to go down a rabbit hole of like of like dissecting criticism of my plays but yeah that that's where I get vulnerable is when people talk about me and not the play because like there because like what happens is like once it's out of my body it stops being like the vulnerability uh, that that's required to put it onto the page like it's like a sort of exorcism and so then it's just there it's like yeah. outside of me and I want like in order for me to go back to that place honestly again I need people to like. Get a, get the fuck away from me, <laughs> and like stay right there. You know what I mean? Because then I can like do it again. You know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so it's no secret that um, much of the theater world, from the critics uh, to audience members to directors to most playwrights, are white. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how this has influenced your work, and whether or not you feel like this has sort of shoved you into this role as. Uh, ambassador of blackness mm -hmm. and, and whether or not you ever feel exploited. That's 
sorry. I've, I've, I've picked the wrong moment to drink some wine. No, this so, is the right like, moment <laughs> to drink wine. Um, I, was like, I was like, I'm going to have some wine, but I was like, oh, I'm really engaged in what you're saying. And I was like, uh, um, but no, so like, I always get very weird about the notion of like what an audience is, what a theater maker is, like who, who is doing the work, right? Because I think that like, um, that we, we have like really specific words that we should use, that, that we can use, and like uh, a lot of non-specific general terms get used. And so like for me, I, as like a black maker inside of literary theater, I feel like I serve like a very specific like purpose. My own project is just like reminding people that like black people have been a part of the literary theater world forever. And what haven't been a part of the literary theater world are black audiences. Um, because white people run the literary theater world, right? It's like academia. Like the literary theater world is attached to the ivory tower. And so the ivory tower only affirms the things that they've let in and they usually let in things that look ivory, right? You know? Um, but like, you know, growing up where I grew up in Virginia, almost all the theater I saw that my mom, my grandma, everyone would take me to go see was black theater. It was black theater by black people for black audiences in theaters bigger than New York Theater Workshop could ever imagine filling every night. You know, I literally saw a Tyler Perry play in a coliseum. A coliseum. Like, that's psychotic, you know? And moreover, not only did it, like, move outside of that coliseum, it, like, people filmed it, and so then he decided to start filming them himself and selling them to people at, like, $15 a pop, and then every, you'd go to people's houses and you'd watch Tyler Perry plays every fucking Sunday. It's, like, crazy. Sorry, I'm saying fuck a lot. It's like, it's like ugh, wine, rosé. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so, yeah, so I think that, like, you know, when I decided to work inside a literary theater, I've decided to work inside of that space because I got, I was very lucky in high school that I had, I had a teacher who um, asked me to read every play that had ever won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and then she also had this book, because she like saw that I had this interest, this like fervent interest in theater. And she was like, well, if you have an interest, and he's like, also, you know those kids that like are like always like, well, I need this, I need this. And you just give them some project that you don't think they'll actually do to like get them out of your face. I think that was part of it as well. Um, so I'm given it this sort of like mythos, but I also think I was like deeply annoying. So, um, but uh, I, I, did, I did that. I read all these plays and then um, I came back to her, I was like, what's else? You know, but like I now know that like, August Wilson isn't the only black person to win a Pulitzer Prize. You know what I mean? Like, Gordon fucking Wilson won one in like 1967, and no one ever thought about reviving that play. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and like, then, and you know, that's one of the few black plays that's been to Broadway, you know? Um, I know I know that like Adrian Kennedy, like, is someone that like Edward Albee, after he won his Pulitzer, like, championed throughout New York and London as the greatest voice in America. Like, because I read all of his plays, and then I read like, interviews with him from the time where he was like, Adrian Kennedy was how I was like, who's this Adrian Kennedy woman that like, Edward Albee keeps talking about? And I read her plays and I was like, oh, g -g -g this is a black play, you know? Because the other black play I'd read that it won the Pulitzer Prize was August Wilson's Fences, right? And I was like, oh, well like, this is interesting, but it's like not like exactly my thing, right? I was like, I, I don't know that I like this as much as I like 2001's Pulitzer Prize winner, Top Dog Underdog, you know what I mean? Or like 2000, uh, or 1998's like Pulitzer finalist, like in the um, in the blood, like in the blood. I read that and I was like, this is theater, you know. Um, and so like there there was this, um, there's this thing when it comes to like uh, literary theater that like makes me know as because like um, when I read all those plays, I started reading other plays, you know, things that it won the Obi, things that it won this, things that were in this big book that she had, and some of them were really weird. And like Dutchman was there, and like which which won which won an Obi in like '67. Um, and I I think that I want to. I, what I noticed was that people seem to erase all those people whenever they talked about theater. They like you know, and like so much so that now for the last, you can look this up. The the I've been doing this big project where I'm like googling like every black play that's ever happened um, in in New York literary theaters, and um, because I'm a psychopath. Um, but uh, like in since 1992, there hasn't been a black a black revived play on Broadway that wasn't by Lorraine Hansberry or August Wilson, which is insane. Which like is a a white supremacist way of telling everyone that there's only two black voices that have ever mass mattered in the history of all of writing, which is insane. 
because that's not true. We all know that's not true. You guys might have like encountered some yourself in some, in some class. You know, it's crazy to me that Alice Childress, the first black woman that was supposed to be on Broadway, has never been on Broadway at all um, because she didn't take the note that they wanted her to take before they were going to do her Broadway transfer. And so then Lorraine Hansberry became the first black woman two years later. Um, and Alice Childress is like one of our great writers. You read like a uh, wedding band, her play, and you're like, oh, Slave Play's not that interesting. You know, like Slave Play doesn't feel that new, you know, because like this woman in the 60s wrote an amazing play about miscegenation that like rocked me to my core when I saw it at like the Anthenaeus Theater in 2011 or something. Um, so I think that like, when I think about my, my own position inside of it, I know that I've decided to make an object of myself. And I think that what I want to do is like wield the object that someone else has made of me into like a sort of battering ram, like, <laughs> like to, to do my due diligence. Because I, 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 I can't ask every person, not everyone wants to make, an op make, make the object that they are um, a tool for violence, right? Or a tool for like a revolution or a shift or change. And I'm not saying I'm like a revolutionary by like writing plays or like having a big mouth. I'm saying that like I am someone who like knows that like a, uh, every decade, you can, you can look at the New York Times, you can look at, look at Entertainment Weekly, you can look at everything. Almost every decade, there's like a big story that's like, women in Hollywood, like women in theater. Like, w did you know that like black people write? Asians are alive, you know? It's just like, it's just like, like it's just like, they, they'll do this whole thing and they'll be like, this is, a, this is the moment, it's all changing right now. And then three years later, everyone's forgotten that that's that happened. And everything's lily white once again, everything's very male once again, everything's very straight once again. And then the only people that last from that mo from that like, do you know? article are the ones that survived the like f the closed floodgates you know and then when they open up 10 years later there's one person standing there who held their breath the, the entire 10 years like you know there's the spike lee there's the fucking it was like it's like you know you see like spike like the response to spike lee was um god uh oh fuck he just died oh my god why can i not remember his name singleton thank you john singleton thank you sorry um so spike lee like gets snubbed for best director in, 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 in 89, and then like the, the Academy decides to like, no, nope, you know what, we love black people. <laughs> let's make John Singleton, <laughs> they're like, we like him. They're like, let's make John Singleton a thing. And so then they do. They take a 25-year-old USC grad student and make him like the black Jesus of the moment for cinema. And then after that, they wash their hands of him. Now he had a, he had a very successful career, he made Baby Boy, but, all, but they were not at all as lauded as like positioned as his first film because they stopped caring. You know what I mean? And the only black filmmaker from that time who stayed relatively head afloat was Spike Lee for in the last 20 years. You know, people forgot about Daughters of the Dust. People forgot about like uh, the woman who directed Eve's Bayou. People forgot about all those things because they, and it's not like an accident. It's not like they weren't talented. It was willful. Because there's a lot of untalented white dudes who keep making movies. Like, I don't know. Like, I look at the people that, like, still have careers. I'm like, that person got another nomination for something? Like, how is that possible? So I think that I want to try to exist so that, like, you know, when a new queer cinema happens, right? Like, it's not just Gus Van Sant that like gets to stay the Oscar nominee. Like, a Gregor Rocky gets to arrive as well and like maintain a career, a respectable career that like allows him to like be making money not just in the like deep indie circuit. Or like an Isaac Julian is like plopped up and positioned in the same way that fucking uh, Steve McQueen was. You know, like we have that we have more sustainability because there's no foundation for black, brown, queer, female success because they they no one allows it to be. Like they like they don't even like people take the the sort of talented tenth of all the like others and plops them up and puts them at the top of a skyscraper. And then when they're like, well how do I get down? They're like I don't know. Yeah. How do you? You know what I mean? And like, and because the skyscraper was built on like the backs of white men, we don't even like we don't we don't know how to build scaffolding to make ourselves up because there's no foundation for us. You know, so I want to try to like yell about it enough so that we can start building a foundation so that maybe this moment when I'm in an article with the the also okay I'm I in this season there were more black plays than I've ever seen ever happen yeah. ever in like my like relatively small relationship to the theater. I've never seen this many black plays that go up in, in New York City. Why is it that they only needed four of us to be the cohort of, or like the names that they, they talked to in this round table with like black playwrights and anything? And also why was it the four black playwrights who all wrote plays that had like an intersection with whiteness in some way, right? Like that's like weird to me when like a woman like Loye Webb wrote a play that was the most popular play at MCC 
ever. It was all black women. Same with fucking Jocelyn Bio the year before, who had a play that got brought back twice, you know? That's how popular it was. But like there was there's like this sort of like um again, it's the scaffolding thing. And my thing is that like, I'm trying to like avoid that little thing as much as I can, even though they're trying to put me up there. I keep trying to like climb down or find the windows to enter into the skyscraper so I can run back down the stairs before they allow um me to be so removed from the community or so removed from my actual politic that I don't have a foundation in order to like keep inviting more people back into that space. That's how I feel about black theater and being a black person in it. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I swear to God, I, I'm not on Adderall. I don't, I just like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like actually like, whoa, I feel like, you know what it is? You know what it actually is? I got in trouble for talking in public recently, and I, um, I've been holding my tongue a lot more when I've talked to people, not because of that person scared me, I was just like, fuck you. I actually told that person, fuck you. But it did, I did start to get like weird about it. I was like, oh, am I, talk, am I talking too much? Like, am I, and so it's kind of fun to be in a barn in Provincetown, <laughs> and it's being like, here's what I think, people. <laughs> Definitely not talking too much. Uh, this is excellent. Um, so my next question. Uh, we are living in a very uncomfortable moment right now as a country. And I think a lot of Americans are reckoning with some hard truths about uh, where we are as a country and what we have yet to leave behind. Um, what's amazing about your work is that basically you put those hard truths on stage. And, and, and both of the uh, plays that were produced this past season are, are basically about how America's slave-owning past affects um, uh, interracial sexual relationships now. Um, you've said that the demographics of your audience really affects the feel of your plays in the room. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think that, like, especially this season, because, like, the first two plays I wrote about were about the thing, I mean, because, like, you know, I was living in L.A., and, like, a, like and I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in L.A. or gone, but L.A. is deeply segregated, like, in a way that, like, Chicago is as well, um, and in a way that Virginia is as well, right? And those, that, that was, that, that, those were places I lived, right? I lived in Virginia, then I lived in Chicago, then I lived in L.A., like, deeply segregated spaces, um, and yet, like, I felt the most comfortable being black in, and affirmed in my blackness in Virginia. Because there was this, like, sort of, like, co- like all this, like, consistent recognition, even in the fact that I could drive by a, a Confederate flag, that, like, that, like, there, that not all white people are good people, right? And not, and, and, like, and that white supremacy is real. There's no, there was no, like, ability to live in a fiction that it's not, right? And so... For 18 years of my life, I got to live with the reality that white supremacy surrounded me, right? And then I went to Chicago, and I was like immediately microaggressed by the program I decided to go into. You know what I mean? Because they, you know, it was a program where they accept 52 people, and only half of us got to stay, right? And one of the first things that one of the people said was like, "Figure out which blacks are gonna stay," and like as a joke. Um, because they were from California and they can make that kind of joke. Um, and I was literally like, no, but you're right. Only two of us are going to stay because there were only four of us. You know, I was like, only two of us are going to stay. So I had to pick, like, I, just, I hope I choose my black girlfriend right, you know, because, like, she's going to be the one I'm with the entire time. Or, and I did. I chose the other girl that got cut. We both we picked each other, um, which was good luck. But um, it, was, it, was very, it was very interesting to have people say things that, my friends back home would have probably said as well, but then if I called those friends out, they're like, well, listen, you know, you know how Rachel, my mom is. She's just so racist. I just, things seep in, I'm sorry. And like, that would be the apology and not like sort of like, um, I'm sorry, what, are you, are you calling me racist? Like, no, I'm not racist. Like, what are you talking about? Like, there was like, there was at least like a recognition of like an implicit bias um, for, that like was like, oh, I was born sort of inside of an environment that allowed this to be, and I'm so sorry. I can't believe that would come out of my mouth. I can't believe, and that would, like, th- that's something that would happen in the South that happened so rarely, especially amongst 19 year olds who are still discovering them, especially during the like Obama years, right? Like the 
the early Obama years, everyone was sort of like, I can say whatever, because South Park's on. And I was like, you can't. Uh, you're not a comedian. Um, and, um, and even then, like, we look back at Louis C.K. jokes, and we're like, that was awkward, you know? Um, so there's like, th there was this thing that made it very prevalent in my mind for almost a decade that my body uh, wasn't being res recognized or listened to and the history of my body was being recognized and listened to in the relationship to the history of everyone else's bodies. And so um, that became like a big, like the, the thing I was chewing on a lot. So those two plays came out really easily. And I think that because I knew I wanted to work in literary theater, I knew that I was gonna be in a space where the audience was primarily gonna be people that didn't look like my body. Um, and I knew that uh, at least when I was going to the season this year, that I was going to be coming in with the ability to maybe get some more bodies that look like my body inside of that space. And I think what I, what I was most excited about was like what the collision of more bodies like my body, and, and that, that doesn't just mean blackness, that means like youth, that means like sort of like, like sort of sociopolitical, like all, all of those things. Like I did a whole thing where I tried to get free tickets to everyone in the, and I got a lot. Um, but I wanted like poor people to be there because like I grew up poor sneaking into theater. So I was like, I want more people who are poor going to see plays in an off-Broadway theater because like that doesn't happen, right? Um, and, and so yeah, it was like, and I, and I wanted people who use the internet, all this stuff. Um, and I, want, I was excited about what that collision might mean. And I think that, uh, it was, I think it was a pretty, I think it, it, all in all, it was a really successful collision, right? Because I think that like people got to see themselves reflected in like new and different ways. And not just because there was a mirror back there, but because they got to sit, I, it was so funny. Like I went to so many of the early um, matinees and there'd be a lot of, uh, like a lot of the general matinee crowd, which is like, uh, like blue haired, like, um, uh, like New York theater lovers, right? Sitting next to like 23 year old, like, NYU students who like have like stood out stood outside in the line all day or like got a ticket from me on Twitter or Instagram because I did some like weird thing and they're sitting right next to each other and like that person's laughing at one joke and then this person's laughing at another joke and they're both like why did they just laugh you know <laughs> and then like a conversation got to be built out of that you know and some of the conversations were like made people feel like a violence had occurred and I think some people finding out that like a question could be a violence after that play taught them something or at least like shifted something for them. Um, and so I think I missed the point of the question now. I think I've lost no, it. No, you're exactly answering it. OK, OK, uh, good. Because I, I was just asking about how the demographics of the audience uh, changes the feel yes, of the Yes, yes, yes. And I think that something that I'm, I was really excited by was the, were the nights when the audience was majority black. Because I felt like there was like a, there was a moment of release for the audience, for the for the for the uh, inside of the room, because like black people could feel like they could look, they weren't looking over and seeing like a bunch of people that didn't look like them laughing, they saw a bunch of people that looked like them laughing, so they're like, oh, okay, so it is okay, great, like I'm not crazy, like I'm not crazy, this is fucking funny, okay, good, um, or this is frightening, or this is crazy, or this does, but like I think the discomfort that the play has inside of it makes it a harder discomfort to sit with when you're in an audience full of white pr people and you're a black person, right? And now that's a discomfort that I've felt my entire life. I've never not felt it, and I don't shy away from it. And I, and I also don't, I personally, don't consider it to be a violent, like, uh, 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 I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't have the potential to be violent. I'm saying that, like, for me, it's generally not a violent space, because I actually, I get, like, this sick sort of, like, joy out of it. You know what I mean? Because, like, I, like, watched, like, Gaspar Noe when I was 12. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, like, weird, you know? Um, but I know that not everyone's like that. And so I think that that was, like, a really interesting thing to witness. And it's also interesting to watch, like, white people in a majority white audience feel, like, really comfortable, like, really getting, really getting, like, a little too much enjoyment out of certain parts. And I was just like, what do you think this play is? Like, you know Because I was in the audience almost every show. Um, and it would just be interesting to see people laughing at things. I'm like, well, no, that's literally not funny. <laughs> like, it's like, um, and like, and then I'd be like, am I doing something wrong? Or are they doing something wrong? Like, what? Like, you know, because because also you watch, you go to previews, you watch audiences to learn your play. Um, and it became a really interesting thing to do because like you, it became a difficult play to learn because like the learning of that play, uh, it requires you wrestling with your own personal sensibilities and the sensibilities of like. 17,000 different demographics of humans. And like, it, it made me actually release the idea that like, 
I knew what every black woman was gonna say when they would see the play, or that I knew what every white person would say when they would see the play. I had to like release that, cause and like focus just in on like what made me feel uncomfortable in the audience and what made like my collaborators feel uncomfortable in the audience or the actors feel uncomfortable. Cause otherwise, like there was no way to quantify it. You know, like a 97 year old black woman came up to Viney Burroughs. She came up to me and she was like, "You have made a Picasso painting of a play." So like, the form is like alive, it is rich. So like, this is one of the most exciting things I've seen in New York in a long time. Uh, another 90 year old woman, Bonnie Boatwright, uh, like is the coolest woman. She cast To Kill a Mockingbird. She's also from Martinsville, Virginia, where I'm from. And she talks with like a deep southern drawl. And she was like, Jeremy, I, my word, I, I have to take you to dinner. And she's going to dinner every night for a week. And she's, she's like one of my really good friends now. And like she is, and she's just like, she's like, I feel like theater actually like feels like it felt in like 1975 again. And I was like, that's a really cool thing to feel. But then people my own age, like literally wrote me off. Like there were people who literally wrote me off as like not okay. White, black, Asian, like Latinx, like all sorts wrote me off. And then other people who were like, you are everything. So I was just like, I had to like give it up. I had to give it up. I'd be like, I don't know what it is. Like, cause in my mind, I literally was like, I'm gonna write this play. And like every old white person in the audience is gonna be like, fuck this play. And all the young people of color are gonna be like, fuck yeah, like he reads theory. And um, <laughs> it wasn't true. It was not true. Um, cause like I didn't give enough credit to the fact that like a lot of the play requires having lived, uh, lived a, uh, and I don't, and I'm saying this not because I'm like, I'm some person who's lived this life. I think that like what I didn't, I, I think because I, I, I've focused on interpersonal relationships a long time. My parents got a divorce when I was really young. And I've always like, and I, and they got a divorce partially because of me, because I caught my dad cheating on my mom. And, uh, well my stepdad, not my dad dad, but I caught that person who raised me as a child, like cheating on my mom. And I was like, oh, they're cheating on you. And I didn't even catch them having sex. I was just like, he's, he likes her. And they're like making out, I think. And mom was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I don't know, I think they're doing something. Like, it's weird. Like, why is she always over? And mom was like, <laughs> mom was like uh, and so I think that from that moment on, I've always been like, I have a keen understanding of like interpersonal sexual relationships and long-term relationships, blah, blah, blah. So I think that like something that like is harder for young people to reconcile sometimes, and even like middle-aged people, people who like, or, or whatever, it's just like a, a relationship that will come to that sort of crux, right? I think that some people are just like, that doesn't make any sense, and other people are like, that makes all the sense. And I think it was really exciting to see how many older people were like, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it was really difficult to see how many young people rejected the sense that I had made of it, or found it to be irredeem like, like irredeemable. Like the, like the provocations inside of her, or were they deemed provocations? Because for me, I was just like, I think I'm just adapting all the theory that like is being taught at NYU performance studies right now. You know what I mean? Like if you read like Christina Sharp, uh, L.H. Stallings, uh, um, Sadia Hartman, like if you're reading these theorists that are like making the like major shifts of our consciousness, no one's saying anything that's like at deeply at odds with, was not to mention like, you know, I, um, uh, Jose, um, Jose Munoz wrote this whole essay about like, and I didn't know this after I'd written the play, that was all about like, um, bro like whiteness as a disease and brownness as like a sort of depression. Um, which is like, I was like, my, my friend found this and I was like, oh my God, that's so insane. You know, and I think that like, there was a queer lens inside of that world too because it like intersected with kink in a way that I think that like, the general populace doesn't recognize that they like still have a lot of like sex shame that they don't want to talk about. Um, because we live in a really conservative, country but yeah that was like a really interesting to see like my my own peers be in some ways i think conservative well you often talk about using discomfort as a tool in your artwork um and yet uh and yet you've you've resisted being described as a provocateur mm -hmm. uh and i and i wonder i wonder what is it that you think someone who says oh well you're provoking people like what are they missing i think that they're like I, I just think that like they like miss the fact that like Lars von Trier made like so many movies. You know what I mean? It's like it's like there are people who made movies that are way darker than any play I've done, and I think that people just like pretend. Like I think that people compartmentalize art, and like I genuinely am like I I, I go see plays. And I'm like, is this children's theater? You know what I mean? Like some like generally like sometimes I'm like, is, is this for grownups? Like because like I feel like we're beyond this. You know, I just rewatched the Norman Lear. Um, did, you, did anyone else watch the Norman Lear live thing? It was amazing. It was fucking insane and amazing. And you should all go home and watch it. It's on Hulu on ABC. But in like, they did just two actual scripts that he did in like from the original show. 
um, now. And then one of them was an episode I love and remember very fondly. But um, but like it was just like crazy to see that like things that you have seen in plays this year <laughs> that are like po groundbreaking political plays were like already said in All in the Family and like better. You know what I mean? And like with more teeth. You know, and I feel like there's like a toothlessness that happens now that people like um, allow, especially in theater, that you don't see as much in visual art, that you don't see as much in in uh, in film, indie film, less so than ma when, like mainstream film, and that you aren't seeing in literature. So I'm just like, what? Like I'm confused. Like Florida, but like Florida was just written. You know that that book where like the woman's like having sex with her teenage, her teenage student. Like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. I think that's what I mean when I'm saying, like, I don't think I'm that much of a provocateur. Like, Cause if I am, like, I'm kind of like, like, I, I actually feel like that's like not a title I deserve yet. You know what I mean? Like, cause I'm not doing anything that is, is even like shocking to me, you know? Um, and I think that all I, all I was trying to, for me, I think that what I was doing was stuff that like, was structurally interesting to me. Um, and that was where I th thought I'd get, um, for me, I thought where I'd be like an iconoclast or like outside of the norm was just the structures I'm interested in. Like I'm interested in like older structures and like structures that like are rarely used and less so like a normative sort of like this is you're watching a play and it's in a living room and then this happens and this happens and then it's the end. You know what I mean? Like that's like less exciting for me. Um, so I think that's what I mean when I say I'm not a provocateur because I grew up watching like you know like you know. The, also, I think that like most people in my generation, like all of us grew up watching The Dreamers that like ended up like teaching us to watch like uh, The Last Tango in Paris. Like, cause like Vera Lucci did both. And we were like, well, if you made this sexy French movie, like what's this movie with Marlon Brando? You know, and then like you, you read like Tennessee Williams and you're just like, well, the, like what's, what's crazy about the like, like the, the last act of, of, of Street Crowning Desire is like ostensibly like very close to the last act of Slave Play. Right, like, and yet, like, people are just like they're like they're worlds apart. I'm like, we do, we do literally this exact same scene in every acting class in America, and like, you're telling me that what I just did right here because it like also intersected with race, and so, it's like so so far apart. Like, I want to interrogate that, you know? So yeah. Um, well, I, I wonder, I wonder if you feel like so you now have made a name for yourself as someone who writes about race. Um, do you feel pigeonholed? Do you want to be writing about something else? Or do you feel like this is an inevitable space for you to be occupying now? I mean, I think that like all, I think that like at the end of the day, like every play I write will be about race and it'll be about queerness. I think the thing that annoys me is that like, like, okay, so like I wasn't nominated for any Lammies this year and I had two plays as a full gay man come out in the season and two deeply lauded plays. And that's no, I mean, one of my friends was nominated for a Lammy this year and, that, and that's a, the Lambda Literary Award. Um, and one of the things I, I was like, am I too black to be queer now? Like, I'm like confused. Like, cause like, like you know, by me watching Slave Play, I'm like, this is obviously from like a queer brain. And the same with like when I watched The Kill My, uh, uh, not To Kill My Queer, um, but when I watch, um, when I watch Streetcar, I'm like, this is a queer like play. Like, this is obviously like a gay man's like relationship to femininity, right? And like, um, and there, there's something that's weird about that to me. I'm just like clocked, you know. Um, but I, I don't have any problems with people like decide because I, I know I'm gonna write whatever I want to write when I want to write it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm writing like an anime right now. I'm writing of uh, the play I'm doing. Uh, the two plays I'm doing next season are both about like, um, like sort of queer performativity in some way, um, and like the people inside of those plays happen to be black um, or brown, but like they don't like it's not a play where like I think the thing I'm more interested in is people needing me to continue teaching them about like their own race, you know, because I think that like the function I actually am serving this season is teaching white people about white people in relationship to blackness. And like, that's something I'm not interested in doing. I was like, no, 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 like that wasn't the goal. Like the goal was me to do like, this other, and I th actually think that was one of the things that like, um, Brantley sort of like outed himself as having a problem with daddy, right? Like it was cause like, it was not a play that was trying to teach white people anything about themselves. It was a play about the black boy, right? And a black boy coming to terms with the fact that he's like inside of a white space and having like, uh, like in, in a, a space where he's made an object of himself, right? On purpose in order to ascend. And then he starts having like a whole psychic drama around the fact that like that ascension is not feeling anything inside. He just like actually is just a doll now. 
and like and like the hole that he needs to fill is a hole that like uh, was left before he was even born, but it's a hole that he's going to keep trying to fill with just money and more objects. Like this is literally what the play is about, and uh, it's a play that's like literally so obsessed with objects that there are like objects all over the fucking stage. Like he makes little dolls, he makes big dolls. It's like literally like an uh, it's like then there's like like the play literally describes every chair on stage, every bottle of wine. Every single object in the play is described deeply. Um, and yet, like, because that the object of Alan Cummings' whiteness was not, like, the center of the, like, play's, like, moral climax. Like, there was a moral lesson for a white person to take away from it about, like, their own being. It was like, well, this play doesn't matter dramaturgically. And the only people that seemed to get it were, like, black critics or very young queer white critics, which was really exciting. Um, but yeah, it was, like, kind of an interesting thing. So I think that, like, that's the place I'm pigeonholed that I'm, I'm kind of, because, like, you know, uh, like, as much as I love, um, yeah. I'm very excited that a lot of my peers are being like celebrated right now, but I do think that there are some plays by, that, that are being celebrated like in weird ways, and I really want to interrogate like how they're being celebrated, because I do think that like some people are using the work by young black writers right now as a sort of like um, Disneyland like ride for like white guilt. They're sort of like, then you go on this ride and you'll feel it, oh, released, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then they can like go about their day doing whatever it is they do, you know? But like, you know, and, but they don't interrogate the ideas deeply. They don't like even like reckon, I mean like seeing Fairview and watching white people cry at me uh, was like so insane. I was just like, I was like, guys, you're not even like, you don't even recognize that like you're not supposed to be, like you're not supposed to center yourself right now. And yet like so many people on stage like demanded my attention. They, de they demanded that I stare at them. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, you all are fucked. Like, you're all rich, you all voted for uh, Hillary, and you all think that that, like, absolves you from, like, every other thing that you're doing, except for in this moment when you're like, oh, I get it. And I'm like, no, but you still don't, because you're gonna forget it tomorrow, and, like, you're gonna, like, go out and invest in another All My Sons, like, remount, and, like, never, ever, like, take the time to, like, look into, like, other black people who might have, like, inspired me or Jackie or Brandon or Jordan or any of the rest of us. And so, like, that is the thing that I'm, like, oh, like, this, all this shit has to be, like, really restructured. So you've actually said that Daddy um, is basically a play about your disillusionment with being able to, you know, the, the, the power... The power that uh, can be uh, gleaned from successfully navigating white spaces. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that, that disillusionment, yeah. and 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 what it means like for 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 you to feel like you need to navigate white spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think that like the like I mean, I think we're in this really weird place with Twitter too, where like. Uh, there's like this, there's sort of like these like splintering discourses, like we're like, you know, I don't know, whatever. I could name names, but I'm not going to. Um, around like people who like just discover their blackness or whatever. And it's just like, no, but like we all have to recognize that for people of a certain socioeconomic class, if you, if you don't grow up like middle class and black and brown, and you like your parents will most likely see whiteness as some like space for ascension. Because literally statistically, like, like there, there, there's a great episode on um, there's a great episode that everyone should watch of or listen to of um, uh, This American Life called um, like Social Status I think I think it's called like Social Status like Tony Hesey Coates is on it but he's not the one you listen to listen to the third part where it's it's all about like what happens when um, this whole town like shifts and basically this this town basically was like fucking over every black person in the town and like all the black people were going, you've heard, you've heard, it's good, it's amazing. Um, and the whole thing was just that like, white people in this country all have like three relatives that they can call and get a thousand dollars, like, or something like that. It's like, this is some weird statistic. But like, black people literally don't have that. Like, literally they don't. And like, so even that tells you that there's like a different, like just like an economic reality to being white and being black that makes whiteness seem more attractive, right? And so my mom did that thing where she was like, oh, I'm not gonna put you in a school with a bunch of black kids. I'm gonna work three jobs and make sure you are in a school where you are the only black kid. And when you're a young kid and you see that like, 
everyone's like called prettier when their hair is straight and everyone's you start just be like well maybe like i'm a wrong and should move closer to whatever they're doing so you like watch clueless on repeat and like start talking like share you know what i mean and like you do the things you need to do so that like you code it safely to everyone there so that you will be the kid that gets the most cookies at the end of the class because you've also been told that if you get the most cookies through these 12 years of school you can go to harvard or yale and that was literally the kind of school i went to and that was the person i was and it wasn't until I went to college and like went to this college where they were like, it sucks for the blacks because only have, and I, I'd always grown up thinking that like, like uh, ascension was a meritocracy, a meritocracy that was like about like performing in the right way, the right time, all the time, and you will get ahead. You know what I mean? And like, I did that. I did that so well. So I went to school and I was like, <clears throat> I don't know, I really am into Carol Churchill. <laughs> Sorry, it's like, <laughs> that's the scene I want to do. And they were like, uh, no black person, you're doing August Wilson. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. It's like, it was like, like this like psychic drama. Um, and I was like, I'm more into Charles Mee and like this and that, thinking that I could code myself into like a position. And what's really crazy about theater and like the arts in general is that it's deeply racialized and no one talks about that, right? And so it's like, you get like so like all those things that might work in like the business world or like the other world to like code yourself to success like you know become president of the United States you cannot do at in like a drama school because they will like make an n-word out of you you know what I mean like they will like shape it so that you will have to be in some way shape or form or you don't get to do the thing um, so that was the moment where I realized like oh yeah like I am. Like, it wasn't I didn't know I was black before, right? But I was just like, oh, whiteness, like, associating with whiteness doesn't, like, earn me anything. It earns me actually nothing, except, like, a disassociation from the body I was born in and the, and the histories I, I have and, like, the community that, like, I, I try to stay away from so as not to be associated in the wrong way, which, again, like, locks me from so many people. Also, most of these people don't like me. You know what I mean? Like, most people, like, actually hate me because I'm better than them. You know what I mean? Like, which was like the thing that like happened all through high school. I remember I got into so many schools that other people in my class wanted to get into, and this is like so narcissistic and like egotistical <laughs> to say right now. But like, I got into like I got all the grants and all the things that like every other white kid in my school wanted. And because me and Modest Niggum were the only two people who got like basically everything we applied for, everyone was like, "Well, I mean." <laughs> Affirmative action wins again. And like that was the discourse and like everyone ignored the fact that I was fucking salutatorian. So it was like, yeah, yeah, no, I also make better grades than you and have a higher SAT score. But like everyone decided like the reason I got into UVA was because I was black. You know, like that became like the discourse around my body. And but even then I was able to ignore it and be like and joke along with it, you know, because that's what you have to do, you know? You're like, like, yeah, like I'm sure like you know, and this doesn't hurt. You know, it's like it's like you, know, you do those things that like also eke away at your spirit. But like when you have this realization that like you are black, you always will be black, and like blackness means something in not only this country but this entire world. Um, in the same way that like being a woman means something everywhere in the world, in the same way that being queer means something everywhere in the world, like it that reminding yourself that uh, it like it 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 shifts something, you know, and it's um. It's a good. Sh I mean, I. I mean, even my queerness was something I tried to like move in a different way from. Right? Like, I was like, yeah. Like, I didn't like. I for a long time, like, I only dated like really masculine sort of like, um, like sort of like, like uh, like boys who looked like they went to the prep school I went to. Like literally, it was like the only kind of guy I dated because I was like, well, if I'm standing next to him, like, we don't like that much of faggots. You know what I mean? But if I like date that guy, like. We will be killed. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, but if I, if I date this guy, like, I'm fine. And I think, like, all, when I had this realization of my blackness and when I had a realization of, like, the fact that I am, like, a full sissy, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a cis man, but I am a sissy. Um, I was, like, released from something and, like, was able to, like, not look at every other sissy like they were, like, violent. You know what I mean? Like, like they might, like, like I might catch it, you know? Because, like, I already caught it. It's done, you know? <laughs> so, um, like, so, like, I learned a lot about myself in, this, in that, that moment of like wrestling with all those yeah. questions. Yeah. So I, um, I, I mean, I, I want to ask one more question, um, and then and then I'm going to. I'm so Wait, greedy. Is it time? Sorry. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, I want to ask one more question, and, oh, then, and then of course I will open things up. Uh, time flies when you're fascinating. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna get a little video here. So, <laughs> um, 
even before you graduated from Yale, which you did this past May, um, the Yale Playwright <laughs> Program, I had to do um, you were already being hailed as the voice of your generation, the black queer playwright that the theater world needs. Um, and you know this this can be all incredibly heady. Uh, you're hanging out with fancy people. Um, how are you blocking out all of this noise so that you can sit in a quiet room or a room blasting anime um, to write? I mean, it's really funny because I think that like, so I I had a lot of fancy friends when I was deeply unfair. I mean, I, I like I always thought that like the book I was going to end up writing was going to be like this like best-selling memoir called like Plus One, you know? Because like for a long time, like I was like the plus one of like so many cool people, and like I'd go to a party with like people, and like there'd be the people who'd be like like they'd be talking to my friend, and I'd be like, "Hi, I'm Jeremy." They'd be like. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> and then there'd be the people who would actually take time with me and get to know me and like actually like looked at me like a real human being. Michael Fassbender is one of those people, and like I really have always loved that because we only met that one time, and he was like, "You're a human. Like, let's talk. Like, I'm a human." Um, and a lot of people didn't treat me like a human, so I never thought I was gonna be treated like a human. So um, I I learned very quickly that all of that was like full bullshit and like didn't actually like kind of matter. You know what I mean? It was fun. It was like a vehicle to like drink for free. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think I still, right now at least, still have like a sort of plus one mentality. Um, and all and all this year, I also was in school, which was like really a great way to do all of this, right? Like I think like everything feels more fabulous to people who are in New Haven. Yeah, yeah. And like and it's like it's so it's like actually like. You know, like, even my mom, I'm like, I, I try to, like, my mom went to this, like, Gucci thing with me. She's like, oh, my God, like, they gave us all this stuff. I was like, Mom, but, like, it's all trash. Like, it's fake. Like, it's stupid. But I get, I get that there's this, like, thing, but I think that I got really lucky by having exposure to that when I was the most ready to be like, mm. um, that, like, now I'm just, like, I'm sort of like, oh, yeah, like, I did it. It's done. And now I can, like, go to that. It can be, like, a day job. And then I can go back home to like my life at school, where like I'm actually more interested in like like so, like what's the gossip on like like who's fucking who now? Um, like there was some really great gossip once my drama. Oh shit! I can't say that. I don't know if this is being filmed. Never mind. Um, but yeah, there was great gossip. There was great gossip at school. And I think what I'm worried about now, and I mentioned this to you earlier, I'm worried about the fact that like. Now that I don't have school as like a base where I can be like at a photo shoot and be like, this isn't, this is fake. Like, got to get back to New Haven in an hour. You know what I mean? Like, now that I don't have New Haven to get to in an hour, um, and I'll be going to like some fancy-ish building in, in like Chinatown. Like, I ended, I stumbled into the best apartment you guys, and it's like actually in a fancy building, but it's like a really cheap apartment, but it's like <laughs> crazy. Um, but anyway, now that I've stumbled into that building, like. How do I stay sane? And I think the way I'm trying to do it right now is by like tricking my brain to still be working or like working harder, like to have like a thing I have to do. It's like, well, I'm taking this poetry class, gotta finish, gotta figure out like how to like scansion this thing or like gotta figure that out because like that's actually gonna be more exciting or it should, I wanna make that more exciting for me than like going to Emily Ratajkowski's birthday party. You know what I mean? Because it's like, she's cool and she's super sweet and like the nicest girl, but that also like, is also like a part of a, like she's also just a friend, right? It's not a, it's not, it's not a, it shouldn't feel like a thing. And I think the more I have a real thing to go home to and dinners to make and like, hopefully at some point a boyfriend, I can like have that as like a piece of stability. If I'll ever get a boyfriend. I think I'm a really annoying boyfriend, so that won't happen. <laughs> yeah. um. Well, you have lots of matchmakers. <laughs> We're working very hard for you here. Um.